Hello, welcome back to Planet Passy. My name is Chris and I am a part-time reseller on eBay. Now, today is not a charity shop haul video, nor is it a carpet haul video or live footage. It's a top tips video. Because I thought I've learned so much from different YouTubers and various information sources. I want to sort of give something back and give a sort of a, a top tips video for people sort of starting out reselling or at least wanting to because when I started out reselling about six, seven months ago, I thought, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to make loads of money and it's going to supplement my uh, my full-time job. And honestly, it's it's not all about that. It's about the enjoyment of finding things out and about that you know you can make some money on. And yeah, just that, the, the surprise of like finding stuff and uh, yeah, just, just knowing that what you've learned is paying off in, in various ways. So here are my top 10 tips for anybody starting out reselling or wanting to start reselling because I made a lot of mistakes when I started out. I thought when I, when I first started out, I thought I was the boss. I thought I was absolutely slaying it. Turns out I really wasn't. And looking at some of my older stock, I'm just thinking, why on earth did I buy that? What was I thinking? So yeah, here are 10 tips that hopefully will prove useful to yeah, anybody wanted to start reselling or has already started and just wants a little bit of guidance, I guess. Now, I'm no expert. I say I've been doing this for just over half a year. There have been people who've been doing this jam for, man, decades probably. So I know I'm by no means an expert in the field, but I like to think that what I've learned over the yeah half year or so can be applied to anybody. So do as I say, not as I did, so to speak, at least in this regard. So without further ado, Let's get going. But first of all, the overriding top tip is, is reselling for you? Don't do it thinking it's a get rich scheme quick because it definitely is not. Uh, it, like most things, it requires a lot of hard work, a lot of persistence, um, a lot of knowledge and learning and all that good stuff. So don't think you're going to go out and the first trouser drop you hit, you're going to find a, a Gucci suit. So, you know, because you you're not. <laughs> well, you might, but it, you're probably not going to, you know, you're not going to. Um, yeah, reselling is, I find it very enjoyable um, as a side gig. Say so I don't do it full time. I never will do it full time. But a lot of people do and, and they enjoy it for the most part. So it, it can work as a full time job should you want to pursue it, you know, to, to that capacity but you need to enjoy it because a lot of people quit their sort of nine to five jobs to do reselling full-time because it gives them freedom to work it gives them and they can be their own boss those sorts of things but you have to enjoy it there's no point quitting the job and then not enjoying it i enjoy it but i never quit it because so i never quit my full-time job because my full-time job is well i enjoy that as well so you know it's <laughs> it's balancing both but yeah this is just purely reselling Top 10 tips of what not to do or what to do. Just some just some guidance. So without further ado, tip number one, start off with what you're interested in. Sounds logical, right? So my background, if you can call it that, is in die cast cars. So what I started out was looking for was die cast cars, thinking, okay, well, I, I could pay a pound for this and I could sell it for a tenner, let's say. You know, so start off with what you what what you're interested in, you know, what you know. Use the knowledge that you've already built up with another hobby. So it might not be die cast cars for you. It might be video games. It might be records. You know, something that you have a passion for already that you have knowledge about and you can go out to charity shops, to car boot sales and just use that knowledge to source and look for the sort of, I don't know, rarer titles and the more desirable titles that you know people are going to want to pay more money for than what you're paying in whatever location you're at you know so yeah tip number one is start off use knowledge that you've already got and then sort of build up to other things which conveniently brings us on to number two tip number two never stop researching and you can do this throughout your whole sort of reselling career never stop learning because there's always going to be stuff that you know nothing about that has potential to make you a decent amount of money that's just lying there. You know, walk into a charity shop. I typically go to the clothes first. I then typically go to the toys, uh, maybe then the media, electronics, that, that, that sort of order. But it, it, I can switch it up. I typically don't look at breakables, ceramics, glass. But there's a massive market for not just antique, but desirable antiques and glass and that sort of thing. Figurines and 
you know, just sort of um, homeware. My knowledge of homeware and stuff like that isn't particularly good. I should branch out into it because I know there's a, a mine of information, a wealth of information waiting for me when I choose to go down that path. And yeah, I mean, glasses, they can be, you can pick up a, or even just a mug, you can pick up a mug for 50p, might be worth 20 quid if you know what to look for. So never stop researching. You know, never stop looking up new clothes brands, um, various electronics, yeah, breakables, uh, video games, I mean, footwear, all sorts, literally anything. Just keep expanding that knowledge base because the more you know, the more things you'll be able to look out for and the fewer things you'll miss when you're out and about. Now, obviously, we're still going to pass things up and you might see something and not pick it up and then go home and, and research it then and think, oh, God, no, I've, I've, missed, a, I've missed a blinder, I've missed a bolo. So we're still going to miss things or we're going to be beaten to things in charity shops or, or car boots or whatever. But use every opportunity, even if you've just been beaten to stuff, to learn what what did that person go for that object so quickly? Now, what were they interested in? Maybe it's got some value to it. Maybe I should be looking out for it next time so there's always room to improve your knowledge base and so i think every day i'm watching youtube videos i'm going on ebay and just doing general research you know what does certain stuff sell for you know what sort of things should, should i be looking out for various trends more to do with like clothing but yeah that's a sort of side a side thing but yeah just constantly building up that knowledge base because like, like i said the more you know the fewer things you'll pass up on and um you have the potential to make more money overall so that's point two. Knowledge is key. So, point number three, and this is, I guess, yeah, it is a beginner thing. So, that point number three is set profit margins. So, what do I mean by that? Well, let's say, I should I get a prop now, shouldn't I? Let's say you go into a shop and you see a nice die cast car, a bit dusty, on the shelf, right? Let's say you pay two pounds for that that's a reasonable price let's say you pay two pounds for that let's say i don't know for sure i haven't looked it up let's say you can sell that for 12 quid so you've six times your money that's pretty good i mean sometimes you can get more than that sometimes you'll get less i set my profit margins and again everyone does different things and that's fine i set my profit margin as four times well i'll aim to get four times what i paid for it so um, a 400% return on investment. So pay two pounds. And in this example, I'd want to get eight pounds back. If I spent five pounds, let's say this was five pounds, wouldn't pay five pounds, but let's say it was, I'd want to get 20 pounds back. You know, you that means you get a nice profit margin for every thing, for item you sell. And to be fair, when your phone goes off and you get that eBay notification, which is one of the best sounds ever, by the way, you want to see a decent amount of money on the screen. You, know, you want to see a £20 sale, a £30 sale. You don't really want to see a £5 sale because it's a little bit disappointing. <laughs> they all oh, had a sale. Oh, it's only a fiver and I paid £2 for that in a charity shop. Because you have to remember, the overall sale price isn't what you make. You've got the you know what it sells for, fine, minus what you paid for it in the first place, minus eBay fees, minus tax, so I don't know the correct maths here. I might put a little schematic on the screen maybe. But let's say you pay £2 for something and it only sells for, let's say, 8 quid. That's four times my money. Well, 8 quid, tax is 20%. So what's that of 8 quid? Uh, oh, no. Maths time. Might put a little schematic here. 20, uh, 18. Well, £1.80. There we go. So 20% tax. Of course, obviously, you're, you're a business as a reseller, you know, that's that's £1.80 gone. That's almost £2 gone already from that eight quid. You spent £2 on it, so that's you basically halved what it sold for. That's £4. Then you've got to take into account eBay fees, which are, I don't know, 12 to 15%. So, you know, that £2, yeah, you, sell, you sold it for eight, but in terms of actual profit, you're probably only making about £2.50 that's coming back to you. The tax man's taking his cut ebay's taken their cut see what i mean so even that four times in that 400 percent return on investment you're still not making a huge amount so yeah chase large profit margins i mean look everyone does it differently that's fine but if you're buying something say for three quid 
and you're flipping it for six quid, you're only going to be making like a pound profit. And after you've, you know, bought it, brought it home, cleaned it, um, done whatever, prepared it, photographed it, listed it, is all that time really worth one pound fifty? You know, when you break it down like that, it kind of doesn't make sense to chase those really small profit margins. So, it's a, it's entirely up to you. But personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. It's just all that effort isn't worth one pound fifty. So, yeah, that's the, yeah, that that's sort of point three. Set profit margins and and just be happy with the returns you get. So part four, and this again, this is through a sourcing. Check over items carefully. Now, we all get caught out. This is probably the one thing where so many people get caught out on because there's I, I'm forever discovering stuff when I'm listing items, thinking, oh, crap, I didn't see that when I was photographing it or, or when I had it in my hand in the charity shop or whatever. It's so easy to miss blemishes, um, rips and stains in clothing, uh, footwear with like where the, uh, the glues come away so the soles like flapping a bit. Um, oh, it could be anything, chips on crockery and you know any any um, just discrepancies to items. It's so easy to to miss these things. Even if you check them over really really carefully, you can still miss things. So all I say is, if you find something good, typically in a charity shop where it's not as fast paced as the car boot, lovely helicopter interrupting there, just check it over. Just check what you're buying is as good as you think it is. Um, I've bought things before thinking, oh my gosh, amazing. You know, um, I, don't know I haven't really got an example. Let's say let's say you find a pair of Air Force, Nike Air Force Ones in a charity shop, right? For, I don't know, let's say a fiver. Well, that's a reasonable price. You're thinking, awesome, five quid. I can get maybe 25 pounds for these. Let's say they're plain white because that's the most common color. Um, fantastic. You get home and the heel is just completely worn away. There's a gaping hole in it. Uh, might be missing an insole. Um, there might be a hole in the in the toe. I, just all these things that you miss in that sort of moment of of madness that you have that you found something reasonable in a in a charity shop or, or wherever. Check things over before you buy them because it's so easy to get caught up and get giddy and just gloss over any flaws because any flaws are just gonna shatter any potential profit. It's gonna bring the price right down. You might not even be able to sell it if there's a big old hole in a in a cashmere jumper say you're like oh because you could patch it up you could sew it up but it's it's never going to bring the profit that an intact item would so yeah that's that's point number i'm putting before sorry <laughs> we go check over items carefully because un i mean just the other day i, I bought a t-shirt checked it over yeah fantastic got it home uh was ironing it and i noticed uh had um i don't even know what the stain was but it's like sort of like a almost like candle wax so it should come out hopefully with a wash. But it's like, oh crap, that could have been, I don't know, super glue or some weird substance. So honestly, even even people that have been doing it a lot longer than I have, like veteran resellers, we're all going to miss things now and again. But just make sure that, check things over before you buy them basically. Because yeah, sometimes if the floor is bad enough, it's probably not worth buying at all. So there we go. That's uh, That's point number four. Um, point number five is, it's more to do with clothing. Um, for the most part, clothing is a big part of my reselling sort of business. It's probably the thing I sell the most of because it's you know, easy to list, easy to pack, you know, all that good stuff. And, it, and it's plentiful, you know. Um, so yeah, focusing more on clothing, I guess, in this one, is that not all brands or item types sell well. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a brand. Tommy Hilfiger. I'm going to focus on Tommy Hilfiger because I've got a bit of a bone to pick with Tommy Hilfiger. Tommy Hilfiger, you say to anyone in the street, Tommy Hilfiger, they'll probably say, yeah, it's a good brand, that's a good brand. And it is a good brand to buy new if you're that sort of person. But right now, in May 2022, I find Tommy Hilfiger just sits. And it sits and it sits and it sits and it doesn't sell well at all. And to be fair, this can apply to quite a few brands that are sort of more premium. Um, Crew Clothing, who I'm a big fan of, doesn't sell well at all. Um, Seems stuff like sort of like Jack Wills. Um, it's there's a lot of it about, and it doesn't sell. The majority of stuff doesn't sell particularly well. Um, but again, this comes with research. It comes with knowing brands, knowing what to look for. 
because oh, let's, take, let's take a good brand that sells well. Uh, Timberland. Let's take Timberland as an example because Timberland they make boots, they make good jackets. Um, these things sell well, but Timberland polo shirts, for instance, don't sell well. Barber is another one. Personally, I found barber jackets do pretty well. Um, barber like jumpers do well, particularly the thick ones. But barber polo shirts, for what they cost new, don't do particularly well at all. So just because it's a really good brand with a good name, don't assume that everything they make is worth reselling because chances are it might not be. But again, this comes back to the whole research thing. Um, you need to, if you find something in the charity shop, just get your phone out. Be subtle, or don't, but you know, try and be subtle. Just look it up. What have you got in your hand? Right, it's a barber polo shirt. It's size double XL, and it's black, let's say. Put those into Google. You know, find, find, try and find that very item. What's it listed for? More importantly, what is it sold for? What's the sell through rate? That is, how many items are listed live, and how many have sold? If you've got more items listed live than sold, then the sell-through rate isn't that great because there are more available than what have gone, if that makes sense. If you've got five items for sale but 20 have sold, then you've got to think, ooh, then that item is, is, in, is desirable because there are far fewer active than have sold. I'm, I'm waffling that a little bit, but yeah, just again, it goes back to research. Know your brands, but deeper than that, know what sells within brands, because not all brands are winners. There are only a couple of brands that I know where everything I've bought of that brand has sold well, um, such as ha uh, Howie's, for instance, which is a Welsh sort of outdoor brand. That, for me, just for me, sells well. Mayer Trousers, another one, they just happen to sell well, but say, it doesn't work for everyone, so there we go. Woo, that's a big one. Okay, that's point five. Okay, halfway through. <laughs> um, point six, and again, it, it kind of relates to the last point. You can probably make money on anything if you wait long enough, right? But how long are you prepared to wait? I'm trying to get another example. Let's say, oh, I'm going to grab the straw hat, but I haven't actually listed yet, so this could be quite ironic. It's an RVCA. So, you know, not a bad brand. It's an RVCA straw hat. I don't suit straw hats. I paid a pound for that. Um, I've no idea what it's going to go for. It might not go for very much. It was an experiment. But here's the thing. You can probably, yeah, like I said, you can probably make money on anything. But how long are you prepared to wait for that thing to sell? That's kind of the, the whole reselling sort of ethos is... Obviously, you want to make money on an item. You want to make sufficient money to cover the expenses, your time, you know, and have a little bit spare. But how long are you wanting to wait to get that money? You don't want to buy something for, let's say, a fiver. It doesn't sell for a year and a half, and it sells for 12 quid. Because you could have invested that five pounds into something that could have sold for 30 pounds and taken a week to sell. So it's all, again... Goes back to the whole research thing. Know what sells, know what to look for, know what sells, and know the sort of profit margins you're likely to get for it. Because you, ultimately, you don't want things clogging up your attic <laughs> or your shed or wherever you sort of store stuff. You want to get things for a price, list it, do all that good stuff, and then get out the door for a good profit. You don't want it lingering around for months and months and months because it's wasting wasting space it's wasting i guess your time to a degree because you want to sort of get it shifted you want to make that profit and if there's no interest in it then why did you buy it in the first place so yeah you, you say you can make money on anything but try and aim for things to be to sort of sell relatively quickly now obviously you can't you know you can't control that it's up to the demand of the public but try and choose things try and find things even that are going to sell reasonably quickly find things where there is a demand and again researching on ebay will help this find things that are in demand and people want to buy because just because something is cheap or is maybe unusual doesn't mean to say it's desirable or vintage or rare or vintage or just because something's old doesn't mean to say it's desirable that's actually that's, that's a good tip that could be a standalone tip 
but it won't be. I'll, I'll, I'll chuck it in here. So yeah, that's probably that's probably tip number six: is uh, try and be careful about what you pick up, um, what you choose to buy, because you don't want to be hanging around. You don't want to be waiting on things to sell for for months on end, because you you, you want to sell things. You want ultimately you want to sell things. So there we go. Uh, that's tip number six. Uh, tip number seven. Let's do. Okay, so um, let me get another prop. Let me get another. Oh. Skoda Teddy. He's not for sale. He's for my. He's for my Skoda. Let's say you find Skoda Teddy at the wild. Let's say you pay two pounds for him. You think great. It's in good condition. Right. I'm going to list him. Take good photo. First, well, this is like a multi-part part. If that makes sense. Take good photographs. There is nothing worse. No, nothing worse than finding a really cool item. But the photographs and the information are just rubbish. Now, the photographs are blurry. It's not all in frame. Um, you know, you, you might have like one photograph and then two, maybe, maybe just one photograph. Um, and you're thinking, I want to see the whole, the whole thing. I want to see, I want to see the tag. I want to see if there are any like blemishes. I want to see, you know, other bits and bobs. Make your listings as comprehensive as possible. Because one. That alleviates any questions being asked, um, and it makes things so much easier to sell. People you take good photos; it draws people in. It's like pretty flowers to a, to a, to a bee. You know, you want to attract people to your listings um, from the off when you when you search for stuff, and then you want to just captivate them with information. Don't just put um, what is this? Keel Toys Skoda Bear used condition send second class postage write a good description make templates for various categories of things you're selling clothing teddies um i don't know die cast cards whatever and just make those listings as comprehensive as possible when i started off i my photographs were rubbish honestly i look back down and think what on earth was i doing um for clothing you could get uh, a ring light or some sort of photo setup. Again, if you're starting off, you don't have to buy all this, but use natural light. Natural light is your best light, I find anyway. Um, make up a little, little photo booth. Have a neutral background. Make the buyer, the potential buyer, focus on that item. Don't have stuff in the background. Don't take photos on the backs of doors. I mean, if you really want to, you can, but typically just get, get a nice plain background. Put a nail into the wall. Don't electrocute yourself. And just yeah, just take take a photo, nice plain background, neutral background. Yeah, Br draw the attention to the item you're selling. Make the photos clear. Take lots of photos. Declare any issues with the item if there are any. Yeah, just make the buying experience as excellent, I guess, <laughs> as you can. Um, yeah, just put the effort in, and you'll be rewarded. I think that's the sort of the saying here. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than a. A listing with rubbish photos and just a rubbish description because it leaves you wondering it leaves you wanting more you're thinking well that they haven't put the effort in if i ask them a question are they going to be responsive you know you're going to go elsewhere so just make your listings as good as they can be and then hopefully you'll draw the customers in there we go top top tip <laughs> that's tip number seven um tip number eight be sure to know postage costs and postage dimensions so what do I mean by that? So I send 99.9% .9 of my parcels Royal Mail. Now I know it's not the cheapest option out there, but I've got a good relationship with the uh, with the staff and the local post office. And I just enjoy, I enjoy going down there and, and talking to them and um, using that service. But I often get caught out with Royal Mail costs. They, they increase prices every year. Um, I need to be aware of the limitations to various um, posting types. So... For instance, a large letter can be no wider than uh, two, so I, well, I guess deeper, and it's about two and a half centimeters. So if you're sending a T-shirt, shouldn't be a problem. A CD shouldn't be a problem. Um, grab this as another prop. If you're sending a, a PlayStation game, and I still need to list this, gulp. Um, if you send it in a sort of a bubble mailer, secure bubble mailer, it will just about fit. But any more than that, and it isn't going to fit a um, large letter. Zoom up again. For instance, a double case definitely won't fit as um, as a large letter, so that's going to have to go like one pound eighty more expensive or something like that. 
So yeah, just be aware of, of the size of stuff and weight in fact, because with Royal Mail, it makes sense to post anything under two kilograms of Royal Mail. Excuse me, jump cut. But anything over two kilograms, it just doesn't become sort of financially viable. You're better off going past a force or every, used to be Hermes, um, or another one of those. So just know, or have a chart even, just have a chart of all the sort of restrictions, you know, what's the, the greatest weight I can send with such and such? What's the greatest parcel size? Um, what are the large letter dimensions? Just get a feel of what postage costs are, because I got caught out loads of times thinking, oh yeah, I can send that for that and it'll cost me this. And you get there and it actually is going to cost more and then you're out of pocket. So yeah, just make sure you're aware of what postage costs are. Um, yeah, have a chart, have a table, whatever. Just know what to charge people for postage um, before you sort of start the listing. Now, you could offer free postage and then sort of meet, make the... Um, make the price sort of inclusive of the postage. And that's fine. And that's fine if you want to do that. But again, be aware of what the postage is going to be so you don't get sort of caught short with a higher sort of postage fee when you get there. So that's tip number eight, isn't it? So whew, two to go, two to go. Um, talking of postage, is, I guess it's kind of related actually, but it is a bit separate. Package stuff securely. Package stuff how you'd want to receive it. So... I've been using eBay for years. Or I used my dad's account when I was when I was sort of less than eighteen. Um, I remember buying cars and them coming in uh, a basic carrier bag. Um, I remember buying Hot Wheels cars and them coming stuffed in a, a carded, um, coming stuffed in a jiffy bag and just being completely mangled. Um, oh my gosh, some of the parcels I've received over the years are hilarious. Well, not they're just annoying because I didn't get what I wanted. Um, but yeah, just package stuff securely. Um, invest, in, oops, invest in bubble mailers for stuff like CDs. Invest in whoops, stuff like uh, packaging bags for clothing. Say they just tear off the, um, the strip here, you can seal it, and off it goes. Um, just yeah, obviously clothing doesn't need too much protection. If you're sending breakables, um, anything where it could get damaged in the post, pack it in a secure box, bubble wrap, um, packaging peanuts, um, packaging papers, anything that will keep that secure. I read once or heard once that, you know, you should be able to chuck a, chuck a parcel out of a first, <coughs> first story window and it should survive. That's a good analogy for the postal system because it does get rough out there. So yeah, just make sure you're pack packaging stuff securely. Because let's be honest, if something arrives and it gets damaged in transit, you're pretty much liable for the full thing. You do not want to pay out whatever the item sold for, then you're going to be completely out of pocket and you might even get a negative rating. So you don't want that. You you don't want any of that, any of that hassle. So just take the time to package stuff properly um, and just, yeah, just trying to avoid the, you know, the, the rig rolls of the postal system because it's, uh, you know, it's... Okay, the start of Ace Ventura, the first one. Remember when he's kicking it down the down the aisle? That's pretty much the postal system, right? So just package it securely, and you should avoid any sort of uh, negative connotations if it uh, if it all goes wrong. So that's my uh, my ninth tip. Now my tenth tip, and again it's again related to that is offer good customer service. Ultimately, you are a business, and unfortunately, now and again you're going to have to accept returns. Now, hopefully the returns are in, they're mild-mannered, they're in good nature, they might have changed their minds, um, something may have happened to it in transit that wasn't your fault, and these things happen. Some things can get lost in the post, even if you send it tracked, it can go AWOL. Sometimes you have to deal with people, um, even if you don't want to. You might have to refund them, you know, fully or partially, you, you know, you it's basically you just have to deal, you have to try and resolve things that were unforeseen, you know, unforeseen circumstances. And it is frustrating, and we've all been there. And yeah, it is annoying when you sell something and, and it doesn't turn up as they expected, or it, it gets lost, or yeah, offer good customer service. Um, you know, obviously, you want to keep the buyer happy, and you know, eBay just favour the buyer, or uh, <laughs> push out another carpet. But it's true that they do, and um, you basically need to do all you can to ensure that the buyer is happy um, and leaves good feedback. And 
yeah, is obviously happy with, with what they've bought. Sometimes they might try and pull a fast one. They might try and sort of scam you. Um, it's happened to me a couple of times. But as a as a top tip, ten point five, I guess. Keep records. Whatever you do, keep records. Actually, this is top tip number eleven. It's going to be a top 11. The title will be top 10. This is tip number 11. <coughs> I'm going to have a swig of drink because I am uh, going to be at part. The tip number 11 or 10.5. Keep records. Whenever you go to the, well, whenever you go to the post office, to try not to reveal any postcodes here, whenever you send stuff, you get, uh, well, I mean, as long as it's a small parcel, you get a reference number. Keep tabs of reference numbers. Keep tabs of tracking numbers. Keep tabs of the postcode of the buyer. What the item was, what you paid for it, when you bought it, um, what it sold for, how many days it took to sell. Just keep keep an Excel spreadsheet of all these things because honestly, it'll save you so much hassle down the line if anything goes wrong. If somebody says, my parcel hasn't turned up, where's it gone? You can use the Royal Mail tracking app if you use Royal Mail. To track things, you, you know, just keep a record of everything you can to make your life so much easier down the line because it's bitten me in the bum beforehand when I haven't had tracking information or reference numbers. I'm thinking, well, I don't know when I sent it. I, I don't know where it's gone. You're out of pocket because you can't prove to eBay or, or whoever that what you've done is true. You know, you've got no, no evidence. Keep the evidence. I'm not saying scan or take photos of every receipt. Just make sure you've got, you know, the thing I said before, just records of each item selling, where it's going, tracking numbers, all that good stuff. Because honestly, it'll save you so much hassle down the line if you can just go on your spreadsheet and go, oh, yep, yeah, that's it. That's where the, that's when those Levi's sold. That's the tracking number. So um, message a buyer, here's the tracking number. Here's where it's got to, whatever, and then they've got nothing to fall back on. Um, I have been caught out before by people trying to sort of, you know, get the upper hand of me and thinking, aha, well, we're trying to try and trick him of his money because he hasn't got records. Well, I have, and then they haven't messaged me again. So, yeah, keep records. That's actually fair. Looking at my list, which is in my handy blue book here, that is probably my number one top tip. If you're going to be doing reselling full-time or part-time, as a sort of as a, a decent sort of volume and capacity keep records because it's just it makes life so much easier it really does i can't stress that enough so that that is quite a long video <laughs> of my top 10 tips for yeah budding resellers reselling is awesome like i said i've only been doing this about half a year or so i love it i love sourcing i love cleaning things up if needs be and getting them looking good and ultimately getting them off to their, their new homes it's such a satisfying experience and you're making a bit of money as well so you know it's a win-win right unless you get a return <laughs> but there we go my yeah top 10 and a bit tips for uh for budding resellers um yeah i hope you've enjoyed this video i've enjoyed it actually i've enjoyed sort of going through and um expressing a lot of <coughs> cut expressing knowledge that I sort of built up over um, over time. Yeah, I hope these tips have been useful. Um, 35 minutes, hopefully, of uh, jam-packed knowledge, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I'll try and get a few more of these top tip videos out, actually. I haven't got any more in store just yet, but I'm sure I'll think of something. I do like sort of sharing knowledge. It's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it is satisfying. It's also quite satisfying. So, yeah, if you've got this far, thank you so much for watching. Um, if you want to leave a like, please do if you've enjoyed it. Um, if you like what you see and maybe you want to check out some other videos, please do consider subscribing because I've got videos coming out reasonably often, depending on what else I've got on in my life. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And, oh, if you want to leave a comment about what your favourite top tip was, or if you have any more top tips that could be helpful, because I'm sure I've missed out loads of stuff um, that I'll probably think about when I turn the camera off, please do. So thank you so much. Take care, and I'll see you soon.